This is the sermon for the fourth Sunday after the Epiphany. This morning we are reading Mark's Gospel, the first chapter, beginning with the 21st verse. Then they went to Capernaum. When the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people there were amazed by his teaching because he taught them like one who had authority, not like the experts in the law. Just then there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, Leave us alone, Jesus the Nazarene. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him. Silence, come out of him. After throwing him into convulsions, the unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. They were all amazed, so they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching, and with authority. He even commands the unclean spirits, and they obey him. So the news about him spread quickly throughout all the region around Galilee. Our text this morning describes an event very early in the first week of Jesus' public ministry. And by the way, the text may also contain one of several truly great understatements found in the Gospels. I think this particular understatement is right up there with Jesus had been fasting for 40 days, and after this he was hungry, to be sure. This morning, we read that as Jesus was preaching, the crowds were amazed for he spoke not as the so-called experts in the law, but rather spoke with real authority. That, however, is not the understatement. The understatement comes at verse 27, not on the part of the authors of Mark's Gospel, but rather on the part of the congregation. To borrow just a moment from Dr. Paul Neuchterlein, who is in turn paraphrasing William Willimon, the understatement comes in response to what happens next, the casting out of a demon. The people in the congregation, having witnessed a scene to rival anything in the movie The Exorcist, look around at each other and say, what is this, a new teaching? If this had happened in any congregation I know, they may have sat for hours in stupefied silence. They may have rushed to the altar in sudden repentance. Or they may have jumped out of the windows in terror. But the last thing they would have done was to comment on how casting out this demon constituted some new educational innovation. New teaching, indeed. A reaction made fascinating by its understated introspection. But what is even more interesting for us, I believe, is that the authors of Mark's Gospel refer to the action of casting out an unclean spirit as a teaching. If it is a teaching, then there is something here for us to learn. If it is a teaching, this passage becomes something more important than the mere relation of a seemingly mythological event from 2,000 years ago. If it is a teaching, then we may, in looking at this passage, learn something about Jesus and something about our role as his followers. The first thing we might notice as we read this passage and the chapters following that constitute Mark's account of Jesus' first week of ministry, Jesus seems to be rather heavily occupied by the casting out of what Mark first calls unclean spirits, and in later passages refers to as demons. In fact, we have no farther to read than the very next passage to see Jesus repeating his performance from verse 29 of chapter 1. Now, as soon as they left the synagogue, they entered Simon and Andrew's house with James and John. 
Simon's mother-in-law, was lying down, sick with a fever. So they spoke to Jesus at once about her. He came and raised her up, gently taking her hand. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. And apparently, as soon as word got out, from verse 32, when it was evening, after sunset, they brought to him all who were sick and demon-possessed. The whole town gathered by the door. So he healed many who were sick with various diseases and drove out many demons. But he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. So Jesus is busy casting out demons and healing the sick. We, in our time, of course, at least those of us living in the so-called first world nations, tend not to think all that much about demons, and we think even less about demonic possession. When something goes wrong, we, of course, will turn to medical explanations, as perhaps well we should. Yet, if we consider the days in which we live, has there ever been a time when people were more possessed? Theologian Walter Wink, writing in Engaging the Powers, has stated, Our society is possessed, Christians as much as anyone else. We are possessed by violence, possessed by sex, possessed by money, possessed by drugs. We need to recover forms of collective exorcism as effective as was the early Christian baptism's renunciation of the devil and all his works. As we compare these two exorcism passages found in the first chapter of Mark's Gospel, we will notice another commonality. As Jesus cast out the demons, entities that by all evidence seem to be very aware of him and the authority he had, Jesus did not allow the demons to speak. In the very first story, as the demon, or demons, as the entity seems to be plural, states in verse 24, Leave us alone, Jesus the Nazarene. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus' response in the next verse is essentially, Oh, shut up! Much as in the multiple castings out, which take place right after Simon's mother-in-law is healed, Jesus will not allow the demons to speak. And that is the first thing we might want to consider as teaching. Jesus, in his authority, doesn't let the evil entities have a voice. Even when they proclaim what appears to be little bits of truth, you are the Holy One of God, they are still not allowed to say much of anything. If Jesus does not let the demons speak, perhaps we must learn to take the same tack. How much do we let demons control our lives? Here I will suggest that while I definitely do not rule out the possibilities of actual spiritual entities called demons, that very well may influence our lives in real ways, I would also suggest that it really doesn't matter what we call the thing that possesses us or possesses those around us. We could call it psychosis or neurosis or disease. But the same truth applies. Demons are destructive. They tend to cause the one they inhabit to do things that are destructive towards self and others. So, for my part, our propensity towards violence, individually and as a species, is a demon. Prejudice of all kinds, race hatred and sexism and ageism and the placing of national pride over one's loyalty to the human family, all of those might as well be demons. Fear itself might be a demon. Both selfishness and self-loathing are demons of our time. And finally, we might go so far as to say that disease is a demon. 
cancer and AIDS and all manner of psychological, physiological, neurological diseases might as well be called demons. There are apparently little, perhaps less dramatic demons as well. Worry, vanity, envy, all tiny yet oddly powerful demons that whisper into the consciousness of our very souls, eating away at the lives that God, our Abba, would have us live. It seems there might be at least a little bit of demon possession in all of us. Perhaps as a little bit of an aside, the author Aldous Huxley, writing in his novel Ape and Essence, declared that the problem with Christian society is that while we are still pretty certain that it's possible to be possessed by the devil, we stopped believing one could be possessed by God somewhere around the third century. Oh, that we might be possessed by spirits of good instead of evil. My question, however, to all of us is how much do we let those figurative demons speak and therefore influence our lives and the lives of those around us? How much are we individually controlled by worry and fear, pride and envy? How much as a society at large are we governed by prejudice, by forces of hatred and violence? It seems, I think, we need a mass exorcism. But remember, Mark's Gospel calls this thing a teaching, something that we need to learn from, perhaps something that we need to learn how to do. Taking a most valuable lesson from our Jesus, it seems the first step is to silence the demons, to forbid them to speak even when what they say may appear to have some grain of truth. Well, yeah, I'm prejudiced, but I have a right to be. I've known enough white people or black people, poor people, rich people, to know what they are like. Perhaps you think so. But I say to you, silence that thought, for it is a demon and it surely needs to come out. And you might say, of course I'm envious, of course I'm worried, just look at my life. And I might say to you, yes, you have troubles, yes, you have problems. I suppose we all do. But in as much as you can, silence that thought as well, for it is a demon, an unclean spirit, as it were, something that must come out of you. For despite our problems, every breath we take is a gift from our Heavenly Father, an opportunity to live in His love. And even the afflictions can teach us what it means to be alive. Now thus far I've been speaking about personal demons, those psychological or physical maladies inside of ourselves. But what of others? Surely you have met or heard of others who seem almost possessed. Now perhaps you might not want to go that far or sound that superstitious. All right then, perhaps you've just met people who seem insane or whose bad behavior marks them as evil or as a thug perhaps. I don't care if you call that sort of thing demonic or not. Uh, frankly, I'd be pretty hard-pressed to use that sort of language in everyday speech myself. Uh, but nonetheless, behavior, destructive to oneself and to others, uh, call it demonic, uh, call it sin, uh, call it whatever you choose. The first step is to silence the voice of evil, the voice of that destructive behavior. Uh, now, you might wonder if I mean whether you should actually attempt or forbid such individuals to speak. And under some circumstances, if you have the authority, 
Well, remember, Jesus acted with authority. You very well may. You very well may have that ability to say to someone, you can't say that. I will not allow you to speak that way. However, in many cases, you may not have that power or authority, at least not in any immediate and obvious sense. So you can't necessarily walk up to every hateful, prejudicial individual and say to them, shut up, you demon, I'm going to cast you out. But your authority and power, while it may seem small in the face of the hateful individuals you encounter, and absolutely minuscule in the sight of a hateful, violent, even demonic world, your authority does extend greatly and grandly to one place, to yourself, to your own life. You can silence that voice so far as you are concerned. You do not need to be influenced by the hate and prejudice the bullying tactics of individuals, corporations, or governments. And in so silencing the demonic voice, at least in as much as it has power over your life, you are in fact chipping away at the stronghold of evil. When you encounter the demon of violence and hatred and silence it in your own life by not returning violence and hatred, you are, however slowly, nonetheless participating in the exorcism of that demon. One other strongly connected point that we may glean from this teaching. Please note the way that Jesus went about dealing with a demon-possessed man in the synagogue. The demon, or demons, recognized Jesus. It is debatable whether or not the man, the host as it were, does, some make quite a bit of the switch from plural to singular pronouns in the passage. We becomes I. There may be something to that. But for now, it is clear, the demon asks Jesus, Have you come to destroy? But Jesus does not come to destroy. Jesus comes to heal. Jesus makes a strong delineation between the man the host, so to speak, and the demon entity. Where many would have looked at that man and said, I don't care if he's crazy or possessed, he's not coming in here. Get that guy out. Jesus differentiates between the man and the man's demon-influenced behavior. The man's behavior was most likely ugly, perhaps even dangerous. So it goes with the demon-possessed. But the man himself, if we take scripture at all seriously, was a child of God, one created in God's image. And Jesus is able to separate this out. And in so following his extraordinary teaching, we must learn to separate the demon from the person or if you prefer a little more everyday language, we must learn to separate the individual from the behavior or the condition. In thinking of ourselves, we're not our sins. We're not our psychoses. We're not our fears. We are not our diseases. The very next step to healing any of that is to recognize that we are not defined by what may be wrong with us. Rather, we are defined by the love that God has for us. Dealing with others is much the same. Do you know an evil person? Do you know of an evil group? Someone or something whose behavior is absolutely wrong, hurtful or dangerous? Of course you do. But the teaching of Jesus would have us separate the person, separate the people from that which possesses them, and seek the healing of the person or the people, rather than that we turn them into other, feeding perhaps the worst demon of all, the lie 
of us and them. As we endeavor to walk in the way of Jesus, let us then remember that we, and all those whom we love, and yes, all those that are so difficult to love and impossible to like, are all children of one Heavenly Father, all of us in need of healing, all of us loved by the one in whose image we are made. Mm -hmm.